Right, next on our voyage into aggression, uh, we're going to look at institutional aggression. Uh, and that is the next point on uh, the specification, as you can see there. Uh, we've already looked at social learning theory, theory and de-individuation. And institutional aggression is the final part of the social psychological approaches. Um, so we're still looking at kind of the psychology here but behind aggression and violent acts. Um, within institutional aggression, we're going to look at two kind of separate parts. The first will be within group aggression. So that's where you've got groups of individuals uh, and obviously within those groups, people being aggressive and, and violent towards each other. And the area we're going to look at there is prisons. And it should be fairly uh, obvious to make the leap as to, to why we're looking at prisons. Um, even anecdotally, it's known that there is aggression within prisons. And the second half of institutional aggression is between group aggression. So when two groups of uh, people or, or races or, or nations are aggressive towards each other uh, and we're going to look at genocide, kind of mass killing, um, and that generally happens in war zones. We're going to look at the, the applied area of Rwanda, which was in 1994, and Nazi Germany uh, during World War II. Right, without further ado then, uh, we'll start with within group uh, aggression in prisons. Um, as I said, anecdotally, yeah, uh, ag aggression does definitely happen in prisons, but there's research support here to back that up. So the Howard League for Penal Reform, uh, as recently as 2010, have found a 20, uh, sorry, 61% increase in assault in UK prisons. Um, during or between 2000 and 2009. So aggression is happening uh, and it's happening more frequently. Um, obviously the, the Howard League, as I said, that was the UK. It's been backed up in American prisons as well. Back, uh, Beck and Harrison in 2007 um, recorded 70,000 inmates being victims of sexual violence within prisons. Uh, I think we all know what we're talking about there. Um, but those two bits of research together um, back up the idea that, yeah, violence is happening within these groups. So we need to kind of look at, well, why is that? What, what is causing uh, this aggression to happen? Why are people being violent towards each other um, in this group? The first idea is the importation model. Uh, and that suggests that it is something about the uh, prisoners themselves that is causing the aggression, so interpersonal factors. Um, so suggesting that maybe, obviously, prisoners aren't coming into prison as a blank slate. They have things that they are bringing in, um, and they are, and that's what's called the importation model, they are importing these behaviours from the outside world. So it's suggesting that these individuals are already aggressive and are then displaying that uh, aggression when they get into the prison in, in that environment. Again, there's research support to back this what to, to back this up. So Irwin and Cressy, 1962, um, suggested that these prisoners have what they call social histories um, and particular traits that they they bring into the the present environment, and they're the ones that came up with the idea that that the prisoners weren't blank slates; they they had something to offer, and often this was quite aggressive. Um, one of those things could potentially be gang membership. So if someone was a, in a gang before they came into prison, well, that might breed and might lead to them being aggressive when they get to the prisons themselves. Um, so Allender and Marcel, 2003, um, found that, looked at different sets of prisoners, looked at those who, who were in gangs before they came into the prison uh, and compared those to... Uh, who weren't in gangs before they came into prison and found that the gang members were much more likely to be the ones that were involved in violence in the prison. Um, and so that suggests that, yes, the importation model is correct. They were importing uh, their gang membership, uh, this history of violence. And so it's something about the, the individual that is, is making them aggressive. Again, backed up by Huff, 98, gang members in America were 10 times more likely to commit murder and three times more likely um, to assault someone in public than non-gang members of a similar age and background. So that's suggesting that 
again, it is this gang membership. There is something about the prisoner, about the individual that is obviously they'll bring into the environment. They're importing that that uh, those actions and those behaviours, uh, and they just act the same in prison as they did out on the street. Um, and obviously that that makes sense. It's got some face validity there. Uh, we'll obviously come on to evaluating this. The second approach is actually saying that, well, maybe the environment has something to do with it. So we've gone from the importation model to the deprivation model. So this is saying, actually, it's the prison environment that is fostering aggression. And actually think how you'd feel if you went into prison. Uh, it's obviously a big deterrent against most crimes is people don't want to lose their liberty. They don't want to have to share their cells uh, or share a cell um, with someone. Um, and if people are put in that environment, it puts great stress on them and people could then act up. And one of those ways is potentially in an aggressive manner. Um, so, yeah, the, the idea here is that this stressful and oppressive environment, these conditions, um, they produce aggression. Um, and again, that makes sense. Um, Sykes said that it's potentially this loss of liberty loss of anonymity so you're not able to do what you want when you want have your own things etc um loss of security maybe you know you 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 can't decide when you're yourself shut you don't know if you're going to get beaten up by another prisoner um that produces anxiety so if you haven't got liberty if you can't move around when you want to if you're not autonomous you can't do things when you want to um and if you're not sure whether you're you're going to be safe that will create uh, an environment where Obviously, it's going to make people act in a particular way. Um, Sykes said that some people might withdraw and they might, you know, they might absolutely wilt under that pressure and, and I don't know, shake in their cells or something. But others would then rebel. They would act up against this and they would almost uh, project and stand up for themselves. And the, the rebellion could come in the form of, well, you know, uh, it's kill or be killed or punch or be punched. Um, and so they could then act violent against other inmates and, and potentially staff. And again, you can see why that that could be the case. So it's not just this um, linear model saying, oh, well, the prisoners are bringing it in here. It's probably a, a mix between the importation and the deprivation model. There is probably something about the prisoner, but there is something about the situation as well that's causing people to be uh, aggressive. Uh, some of those things are uh, crowding obviously there, there's lots of people in there uh, we've already kind of mentioned the fear uh, frustration at not having uh, their own things again staff experiences is, is something that's that's been looked at as well so if the staff are inexperienced they don't know what they're doing within the prison that could be frustrating for for the inmates uh, and again that might lead to aggression there's a bit of research um, by Hodgkinson et al that um, found trainee nurses were much more likely to suffer from violent assaults than more experienced nurses. So again, that, that could be maybe within a, okay, we're talking about a, a hospital setting there, but um, that shows that staff experience does have a role to play. And there's actually research by Davis and Burgess that back up that that happens in prisons as well. The more experienced prison officers are, are less likely to uh, be assaulted. Uh, and again, the assault, probably comes from frustration by the prisoners. Okay, so those are the two ideas that it's either, um, as I said, the importation, it's what the prisoners are bringing in, or it's the deprivation, it's what the, uh, the environment is causing. So we need to look at, well, which is correct, or, or are they both, uh, and is there any supporting research or contradictory evidence? So obviously what we spoke about already, uh, that's AO1, uh, you, you'd use that in your AO1 answer. This is then AO2, this is evaluation. Um, and we're being a bit critical then of these theories of why there is within group aggression. Um, again, focusing on these prisons. So the first bit of research then um, is looking at the importation model. So Hera and Stefan Meiser, yeah, I probably said that wrong. Uh, 2006, um, conducted a meta-analysis of prisons, or looked at lots of different prisons, sorry, looked at 58 US prisons. Um, and what they found in those prisons was that black inmates tended to have higher rates of violent behavior uh, than other prisoners, but lower rates of alcohol 
and drug related misconduct. Um, and this is supporting research because actually this um, mirrors what's found in the outside world. So um, generally what we find is that um, people can, committing crimes in society tend to have their, uh, there tends to be higher rates of um, violent crimes committed by black people um, and lower rates of alcohol and drug related misconduct. So that's found in the outside world. If we're then finding that again in prison, well that would suggest that yeah, it's actually the individual, it's, it's the person there. Because otherwise if we're saying well it's the environment that's causing aggression, well that should be indiscriminate, shouldn't it? Everyone should be acting the same if they're in that same environment. Whereas actually, we don't find that. We find breakdowns and makeups of behaviour uh, within prison that's found on the outside world as well. And that would suggest that actually, yeah, it is this importation model that's correct. People are bringing their, their behaviours and their traits to the prison rather than uh, the prison fostering it itself. Um, However, there has been questions over whether gang membership is um, directly linked to aggression within prisons. So Diliti et al. Um, found that actually gang members tend to be no more violent in prisons than other members. So people that weren't in gangs compared to people that are in gangs within prison, there seems to be no difference between how violent they are. So that, that, that's a contradiction to what we've already said. Um, and so it kind of questions the idea of whether that's actually true. However, there is potentially an explanation for this. Um, and it is that, well, maybe there's an expectation that if uh, prison wardens and the authorities know that these people are in gangs, they might then um, actually isolate them uh, within the prison. And that gives them less opportunity to be violent. And so actually, what you might find is that if they were treated the same as everyone else, then there would be a higher incidence of aggression. So again, this isn't a, a linear thing. We can't say, yeah, definitely being in a gang makes you more aggressive. There are lots of factors um, that, that you need to take account of. Uh, Fisher in 2001 found that actually if these gang members are actually isolated, um, then it reduces the rates of serious assault by 50%. Um, so again, that does suggest that, well, maybe they are more aggressive, but in the right type of management, we, we can stop that being shown in the, in the prison environment. Um, so yeah, that's a nice evaluative point you can make there. That's a, that's a good AO2 um, point that you can then elaborate on a, a good paragraph when it comes to, to writing your essays. Um, okay. Evaluation of the deprivation model then. Um, McCorkle et al, um, they support the idea that, yeah, it is, it, there is an effect of the environment, of the, the conditions that the people are in, um, that are potentially leading to aggression. So suggesting that overcrowding, lack of privacy, lack of meaningful activities, there is support there um, that these do lead to aggression. That being the case, what would what would be obvious to say then is, well, if we can stop it being overcrowded and if we can uh, increase privacy and if we can make some meaningful activities, then maybe we can reduce the aggression. Um, and, and that would make sense. If there is a causal link there and we sort out the cause, then we should be able to reduce the aggression. <coughs> Excuse me. However, as you can see from that second bit of research there, um, Nijman et al in 99, increased personal space, but that didn't reduce violence. And so again, it's not that that easy just by saying, oh, well, this is the thing causing aggression. There, there seems to be a, um, a big mix of things. Um, and it's prob probable that for any one individual, there is a mix between what they're bringing into the environment and the environment itself. <coughs> Finally then, um, there's a bit of research that suggests, well, actually, maybe both of these theories can be right at the same time. And actually, they are methods of explaining different types of aggression. So there is the suggestion that maybe deprivation leads to staff violence. So the prisoners might think, oh, well, I'm being refused my liberty by, by this person there, making me go to bed at a certain time, and I I'm not allowed to, to I don't know, go on computer or Facebook or whatever it is they want to be doing and they 
put that onto the prison guards. And so they act aggressive towards staff from the deprivation model. But actually, it's probably more likely to be the importation model um, against other inmates. If they're likely to be aggressive on the outside, then they'd be aggressive on the inside to that person. <coughs> Excuse me, recovering from a cold. And still making videos. That's my dedication to the cause here. I hope you appreciate it. Um, finally, then, for the evaluation of the um, institutional aggression within groups, um, we're going to look at a bit of IDA. So um, I've mentioned this before, issues, debates and approaches. You need a bit of IDA in your evaluation for uh, unit three, especially. And one method of IDA is application. So real world um, applications to theories. Um, and this comes in the form of looking at the, the deprivation model, the situational factors. So um, another bit of research here at HMP, Her Majesty's Prison, Woodhill, by Wilson, looked into whether if changing these situational factors could actually improve outcomes in terms of um, lowering aggression. So they developed a less claustrophobic um, and less prison-like units <coughs> um, which included um, reducing the, the usual noise that you'd hear in prisons by, by putting on a local radio, um, allowing prisoners to have views, so not all rooms necessarily had an, an outside view, but they, they made sure that happened in this unit. Um, it used to be stiflingly hot in, in some of these prisons, so they made sure the, the temperature was fine. They tried to get rid of some of these um, issues that were identified in the deprivation model, basically. Um, uh, and make it uh, a lot better. And what they found was that it completely eradicated uh, assault on staff and inmates. So it really did reduce the depression. There's some really good here, um, applicable evidence that, yet yeah, the deprivation model is correct in that it is this situation in cre it, it, sorry, um, leading to aggression. And if we reduce the situation, then um, we can stop aggression in prisons. Brilliant, I hear you say. However, obviously, uh, newspapers like the Daily Mail get involved in this and say, oh, well, you can't give prisoners Sky and Xbox and they're, they're living the life of, life of Riley over there. It's like a hotel. Um, and so, obviously, it may not be seen fair that giving prisoners these privileges, although on a day-to-day -day basis, it's obviously helping guards and other inmates and stopping people getting shanked. <coughs> Um, due to political pressures, this isn't by any means the uh, the norm, and um, so it doesn't doesn't happen on a routine basis. But at least here we've got some research support that it should, and, and maybe it should be revisited um, at a later date. Right, the second half of institutional aggression. Then, um, so we're looking at prisons as within particular groups, people being aggressive towards each other. This is between groups. So when one group of people are aggressive towards another. Um, so when there's hatred and when there's hostility between two different groups, they get uh, there's hatred between them. Then that tends to lead to violence. And we're going to look particularly at genocide. Um, definition there, Oxford English Dictionary uh, of genocide is the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular nation or ethnic group. Um, and I think if I uh, read that uh, and asked you to come up with an example, most people would jump straight to um, Jews in World War II. Um, and yeah, that's one, one area we'll look at. Uh, maybe a less well known one, but still in, in fairly recent times, is the genocide that occurred in Rwanda in 1994. Um, and we'll, we'll look at that in a bit more detail in, in a moment. But yeah, so um, genocide, what, one example is the, the six million Jews, that's an extraordinarily large number, um, killed in World War II under the Nazi regime in Germany. Um, why was there such hatred between um, that ethnic group and um, the, the German people at the time, uh, and we'll look into well how aggression is bred between these two different groups. <coughs> Rwanda, for those that, that don't know, as I said 1994, um, 800,000 uh, Tutsis 
killed by Hutu extremists. So there were these two different groups within Rwanda. There were the Hutus and the Tutsis. Uh, and by all accounts, there's a, there's a good film called Hotel Rwanda. I'd recommend it. Um, and by all accounts, there's very little difference between these two groups. It was, it was almost fabricated. Um, <coughs> but one group were in power and the other weren't. And um, basically, that's how it occurred. A big power struggle between the two groups. And the, the Hutu extremists, to try and ensure they um, stayed in power or, or gained power, um, committed this systematic killing of, of the other group, the, the Tutsis. Um, and over a hundred day period, um, these 800,000 people killed. So that's that's very extreme. Um, and we need to look at, well, why? What was it about one group and another that, that caused such extreme aggression and violence and, and killing? Um, there has been a five stage model to genocide, um, which has been found in, in most cases of genocide. These are the five stages that that tend to occur. So first, there tends to be difficult social conditions. So maybe economically, maybe kind of food and um, instability. That's that's the first uh, stage in genocide, and it tends to be people would then group together um, and move on to the second point um, and the second stage, and that's scapegoating. So blaming the the other group for all of the wrongs or things that aren't happening that maybe they, they feel should be. Um, and so it, it just breeds it. It then goes into dehumanization. So they almost don't see the other group as, as equal. They don't see them as human in, in some cases. Um, and it's just, just feeding this hatred and anger. Um, and because of that, because of the dehumanization, moral values and rules appear in, inapplicable. <laughs> so if you don't see another group as human, you then may not believe that they have rights to, to or human rights. So it's acceptable to kill them. Normally, uh, there's great inhibition about, you know, human life is, we like to think, sacred. Um, and you it's seen as a, very much a bad thing to take the life of another. And obviously, um, in, in peacetime, there, 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 are, there are strict rules against it. Most organized religions are, are very against killing of another human so it is seen as a bad thing however there are conditions where it's made more acceptable um, and and that's these these five stages of of genocide and that's when the killing begins and then if bystanders are passive uh, so the people observing in this case or in the case of you uh, sorry Rwanda at least uh, the United Nations um, then it almost allows it, it almost says oh well that's okay if they're, if they're not doing anything and that's how then we can lead to these these mass mass killings um so on the face of something that looks completely you know how can six million people be killed uh, how can eight eight hundred thousand be killed in 10 days well there, there are certain conditions where obviously th that tends to happen <coughs> looking at the dehumanization point then because um, that was 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 one of the stages um, that we'll, we'll try and apply that to, to these situations. So as I was saying before, usual inhibitions about killing humans seem to be lessened. The, the groups are made to seem, the other group are made to seem like animals um, and worthless. So um, during the Rwandan conflict, the, the local radio, RTLM, um, which was run by the Hutus, um, who, who, who conducted the killings of the Tutsis, they described the Tutsis as cockroaches. And again, if you think of a cockroach, you probably see one on holiday, run screaming, uh, and a lot of people wouldn't think anything about stamping on one. Whereas obviously a human, you'd like to think you wouldn't stamp on them without getting some sort of retribution. Um, and so if that's the case, and, and that starts getting in the mindset, of, oh, the, the, those, those cockroaches, it would then seem more acceptable potentially to um, perform acts of violence towards those people um, and that's why dehumanization um, is quite important. There's a website there lucifereffect.com um, and that's Philip Zimbardo's website if you remember from the Zimbardo prison experiment um, and he's got some good information on there about um, how other groups are, are made to be um, portrayed um, and actually that that picture you see there to the to the right hand side that comes from um, the website, so the, the enemy seen as beasts, reptiles and insects. Um, and you see there, the, these are depictions of 
um, other groups by particular societies. If you look at um, the bottom right hand corner, English pigs, that was in the IRA. Uh, and again, make, trying to make uh, English people be perceived as animals, dehumanize them um, to almost legitimize particular acts. Um, so it's one, one aspect that could potentially lead to, to genocide. <coughs> Another point you may be more aware of, or should be, from your AS studies, so that's um, the Milgram study. So this is the, the electric shock study, um, and saying that, well, people do act if they're, if they're told to by an authority figure. So obedience to authority. Again, if you want to remind yourself of that, 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 that website there is a good one. Um, and again, you can read over your, your AS notes, but you could then apply that research um, giving electric shocks or fake electric shocks to to a learner you could then use that to maybe explain why maybe these Nazi soldiers committed genocide because they were being told to from above um, and that could again explain some of these violence and some of these acts so why is there between group aggression well obedience to authority maybe maybe a part of that okay a uh, bit of evaluation then so again that was all a01. Um, and so if we then look at some AO2 and evaluating this, do, 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 has what we spoke about, does that accurately describe um, aggression between groups of people? Um, well, the fact of the bystanders, yeah, potentially. Um, you would expect if there was intervention, as in Rwanda, the, the United Nations going in there, it should pre prevent genocide. Um, and as I've said before, if you did, if they were doing nothing, it almost it says it's okay. It's like, oh well, um, we, we've seen what you're doing, and it's fine. And so, obviously, in, in more recent times, it's there's big debate. Is there isn't there as to whether countries should go in and um, uh, intervene in other countries? Syria, most recently, um, maybe the United States and Britain have had their uh, hands stung before by uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, but. It needs to be kind of stopped and if you don't then <coughs> that almost um, makes it okay however there is a an argument to say well don't just rush in because intervention may increase the severity of the action so it could well be that um, in the Rwandan conflict I say this all happened in a hundred days um, so and the UN were involved there um, so it may have shortened the duration of the conflict, but it may have intensified the actions that actually happened within that time. And maybe so 800,000 people in 100 days, that's 8,000 people a day. Um, if there was no one watching, maybe they, they would have thought they had more time to, to get the message across or something. And it, it, it could have um, lessened the actions that happened. So it's a delicate balance between yeah, intervening or not, and that's a that's an evaluative point to um, the fifth point made about um, how g genocide actually happens. Um, the point on the dehumanisation again, this is almost IDA um, because it is a, a, an applied um, example of looking at dehumanisation. So S's et al um, said that social dominance orientation so that's like a, a personality trait so people could be high or low maybe in social dominance or orientation the idea is if people are high in social dominance orientation uh, they believe in social hierarchies they believe in an upper class a middle class a lower class um, and they believe in intergroup inequality they believe there needs to be a, a, a marginalized lower group to serve those that, that are higher than themselves um, oh, sorry, they, they believe they're higher than, than these individuals. Um, and that will lead to dehumanizing um, dehumanizing of these other groups. So the out group, um, people that aren't themselves, they would see um, as inferior. Um, and this, this can be seen maybe more recently with kind of refugees and immigrants. And, and um, they, they, again, you only need to look in national press to see examples of where um, immigrants and refugees are, are referred to negatively and scrounging and taking in brackets our jobs um, that can again lead to dehumanization so you you marginalize this group and again that could potentially lead to violence and aggression 
Uh, and again, that, that's why it's uh, IDA here issues debates and approaches because that is an applied example of, of the dehumanization. Um, and finally, there's a question over whether, well, can obedience actually be used um, as a, a, an explanation for um, aggression between groups, in particular genocide, this is a big thing. So Mandel has said that maybe Milgram's study didn't, didn't have um, external validity. So fair enough, you, obedience to authority is sufficient to explain why one person might give another a hypothetical electric shock, but that's a big jump to then killing six million Jewish people. Um, and so it, maybe it's not a um, the, the the only explanation. There may, may be something else going in, uh, sorry, going on. And actually, that's been backed up by historical records. Um, and Goldhagen said that actually it wasn't just obedience. There was some deep rooted anti-Semitism um, within Germany at the time. Obviously, it was fostered by uh, the Nazi regime, um, and they you know they taught kids. Uh, um, that Jewish people were evil and that they, they were money grabbing and um, not very nice stuff. And that was almost ingrained into the psyche of that culture at the time. So it wasn't just obedience. It was the fact that actually these people were, were, were taking that on board. Again, it was still wrong and they were brainwashed, but it's saying that maybe obedience isn't um, a good way to describe how uh, institutional aggression can happen between groups specifically in terms of genocide and actually that's about all you need to look at in terms of institution aggression so quick recap it's it's the two types you've got within group aggression so we looked at groups of prisoners aggression between the prisoners and then between groups so one group being aggressive towards another uh, and obviously you need a little bit of theory for each of those so that's the AO1 and then you need to be able to evaluate whether that theory is any good in explaining um, why aggression happens in these circumstances. Um, so I hope you found that helpful. Um, it, I got my information from this from the Cardwell and Flanagan textbook. Um, it's pages 70 and 71. Um, so there's a bit more information on there and some questions at the bottom of page 71 um, that you should be able to, to test yourself on. Um, so happy learning and I will catch up next video. Thank you very much.